Okay, so we just finished talking about phagocytosis. Let's talk inflammation, our second topic. Again, for y'all's PowerPoint, this only shows up once. I'm using it over and over because I want you to be able to see where I'm going and why. Inflammation is a response that is triggered. It's a chemical response triggered by damage to body tissues. The characteristics that we see with an inflammatory response include redness, heat, swelling, pain, and depending on how bad it is, maybe even loss of function. But redness we call ruber, heat we call calor, swelling we call tumor, pain we call dolor or dolor if you're Spanish. Um, but these are all characteristics of an inflammatory response in or on the body. So why do we do this? What's the function? Why do we have an inflammatory response? One of the first things that we always want, we want immune cells to go to where damage happened. So having these chemicals getting released actually attracts the immune cells to the site where damage has happened. Another thing, we want repair of the tissue damage that has happened. And if there are microbes that have entered, we want to limit the effects of what they can do. We want to isolate and kind of, you only get to stay here, limiting their effects. It's not everywhere, it's just right there. And finally, which ultimately we want for all of our immune system, we want to destroy microbes that are in that site. So again, you will see this picture. I'm going to blow them up so that I can talk about them. Injury and immediate reaction. I have a nail going through the skin. You can see that it carried bacteria with it. I already have my mast cells. Remember I said those are anchored at potential points of entry. You can also see that this actually ruptured this blood vessel. The blood vessel is not connected anymore. Following an injury, early changes occur in the vasculature. Vasculature being your arteries, your veins, and your capillaries. These are the tubes that hold your blood in your cardiovascular system. In the vicinity of the damaged tissue, these changes are controlled by your nervous system stimulation, chemical mediators, and cytokines. All of these things are released by blood cells, by tissue cells, even by platelets at the injured area. Some of these are vasoactive. Vasoactive. Vaso means vessel, like a blood vessel. They affect the endothelial cells and the smooth muscle cells of blood vessels. And there are other chemotactic factors called chemokines that affect the white blood cells. Where have I been damaged? Right there. I want to release chemicals that are going to cause white blood cells to go right there. The chemokines are going to attract them. My blood vessels in pretty much my entire body have the ability to open up and shrink. The smooth muscle helps me to do that because I mentioned smooth muscle. It can help me to change the size of these vessels. If I am bleeding profusely, this would help because I can shrink the vessel and try and make sure that it's not bleeding profusely. Second step, vascular reactions. In very quick succession, the blood vessels will dilate, shrink, and dilate again. It is believed that the reason for that pattern involves opening really fast to let the blood flush out the tube, closing it to try and make sure that we're not excessively bleeding, giving enough time for my white blood cells to kind of start coming around, and then opening again to allow those immune cells to the area that needs them. The fact that you have that opening and closing and opening is one of the reasons why you have redness and you have fever at the site that damage happens. As this leaks, red blood cells are gonna be in there, causes redness. The blood itself is going to be warm and the chemicals are also going to cause this area to heat up. Some vasoactive substances cause the endothelial cells, the lining, in the post-capillary venules to contract. 
that contraction squeezes some fluid out. That fluid is called exudate. Third step, edema and pus formation. Remember, edema just means swelling. If I've got all of this fluid leaking, eventually it's gonna puff up the area that's been damaged. That's the edema. It's where that fluid has built up. If you look at the picture, see all the yellow? That's all of the um, fluid that has been collected. You can see that the flesh itself is kind of puffy. You've got a scab, but there's still redness here. Chemicals are being released, such as plasma proteins like globulins and albumin, even the clotting protein fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is water soluble, so it'll dissolve, but if it gets converted into something called fibrin, it will actually form a clot. Depending on what the fluid looks like, if it is clear, it's considered serous fluid, but if it contains red blood cells and neutrophils and even bacteria, we call it pus. Pus is something that is generated by our phagocytes. Also remember that this time frame, this weight time frame, we've been releasing chemotactic factors. So at this point, my neutrophils have been coming and coming and attracted and attracted. So even in the picture, you can see we have a very high number of neutrophils now at the site of invasion. All of those bacteria that we see, we need to get rid of. Having the phagocytes come to that place will allow us to get rid of them, get them out of the way. Resolution and scar formation. Once we have as much of the damage repaired as we can get, our last step is to put healthy tissue or scar tissue in place to heal the wound. You can still see there are some bacteria, but you can also see that that blood vessel has been repaired. You can see that the skin has been repaired, but we have a scar. Scar tissue is different than regular tissue. It's actually a type of connective tissue instead of the skin tissue. You can also see that we've got the macrophages coming in. Remember I said macrophages come late in the infection? Well, they're going to be responsible for cleanup in this case. Once my blood vessel has been repaired and there isn't a huge hole for me to escape out of, I have to get into the tissue still, and I do that by a process called diapedesis, which I will talk about in the next slide. Literally, I am cleaning up, taking care of the last of the bacteria that are present, and replacing the tissue that has been damaged. So diapedesis. Diapedesis is a way for me to get out of a blood vessel if that blood vessel is sealed. If I'm a white blood cell, I have the ability to smush myself into a small, almost like toothpaste type thing that can get out. The best way I can think to describe it, in the movie Venom, the original, not the second, let there be carnage, but the original Venom, Venom ends up getting taken out of Eddie when he's in the MRI machine. And he ends up going into an air vent. And if you'll remember, he was this big mass of stuff, but he kind of squeezed himself through the grate. That's kind of what our cells are doing. Our blood vessels have pores in them. Remember I said, we drop off, we pick up, we need these pores to be there for that to happen effectively. But my neutrophils will get stuck the chemotactic factors actually change the lining of the blood vessel next to where the damage is and basically turn it into sticky and they get stuck. And once they're stuck and they can sense these chemotactic factors, they will squeeze themselves out of the blood vessel through diapedesis to get to where these chemicals are coming from. Phagocytosis, inflammation, let's talk fever. A fever is an abnormally high body temperature. Ultimately, that's what it is. Why do we get fevers? Well, if our body detects a foreign invader, it can release cytokines, specifically in this case, something called pyrogens, that cause the hypothalamus, which is the body's thermostat, it's located in the brain, to raise the body temperature. 
So normally the hypothalamus keeps us at 98.6, no big deal. But when pyrogens get released, it goes to the hypothalamus in the brain and says, hey, dude, we need to up the temperature. So it raises the thermostat. Why? Why would we do this? We know from previous chapters that bacteria like it at 98.6. Our pathogenic bacteria love it at 98.6. When you fiddle with that, they don't like it. Does it kill them? Not necessarily, but it does inhibit their growth. If they can't make more numbers, they can't really truly become infectious. That helps us. It helps us get our immune system off the ground and actually have less numbers to deal with down the line. It also decreases iron availability for the microbes. Now you might be going, okay, so what? Iron is really important. Almost every pathogenic microbe that there is needs iron to live. If it can't get it, it can't function properly. And having a fever actually makes it harder for them to get to iron and catch it. And with any chemical reaction, if you heat it normally, or with most chemical reactions, when you heat it, it speeds it up. This actually helps to speed up the immune response of the phagocytes as well. Again, these are the cytokine releasing cells, right? Depending on which cell you're talking about, it's going to have the ability to release cytokines, pyrogens, that help to cause fever formation. Finally, let's talk about antimicrobial proteins. There are four proteins I'm going to mention. Interferon, the complement, iron binding proteins, and antimicrobial proteins. Interferon is a chemical that classically is known to interfere with a virus's ability to produce viruses. And it does this by advanced warning to a cell that is probably going to get infected so that that cell can take steps to inhibit the virus from working properly within it. The complement is a system of proteins that through a cascade reaction actually creates something called a membrane attack complex, which I will talk about in a minute. Iron binding proteins. These are proteins that keep iron away from just floating around in the body. Remember I said almost every pathogen that will attack our body needs iron. If I can play keep away with that iron, they can't get access to it and they can't function properly. And finally, we have antimicrobial proteins. For the most part, these are things that damage the microbe. So the classic way that people think about interferons regards viruses. Interferons are chemical signals that get made when a cell is infected with a virus. In the first cell here, we have a virus that comes in, takes over the machinery, starts making copies of itself. In reality, this cell is dead. It's already infected. There's nothing it can do to fix it. It's going to die. But when this virus infects the cell, you actually have specific genes just by the inherent nature of the virus being there they get turned on that create interferon. Interferon is a chemical signal that gets sent to any neighboring cells. The neighboring cells, when they come into contact with interferon, it's a red flag that somewhere nearby is a cell that is infected with the virus. The interferon starts a cascade of events that sets the cell up so that it is not susceptible to the virus anymore. What I mean by that is it starts turning on genes that will create enzymes that will degrade the virus's nucleic acids, DNA, and RNAs, and it also creates proteins that will prevent the viral nucleic acids from having access to the ribosomes. If it doesn't have access to the ribosomes, it can't create anything. It can't create the capsid. It can't it can't even make copies of its own DNA if you're chopping it up like scissors. That ultimately means that this cell that has already been forewarned, even if viruses do get into it, they're not gonna be effective. They can't infect the cell. So it's kind of an early warning system. And this is the classical way that people think of interferon. It's also an effective intercellular communication signal. 
meaning that it goes between the cells. From this cell to that cell, we had a specific type of communication that allowed this cell to warn this cell there's a virus in the area. And while most of the thinking with interferons is specific to viruses, some more recent research suggests that it's not just viruses as a microbe that this helps to forewarn cells about. As far as the world of pharmacology goes, this has also been used to try and create antiviral drugs. And in some cases, it's been successful. Now let's talk complement. The complement system is a series of 30 proteins that are normally floating around the blood and they are inactive. They're not working at all. But when they get activated, it causes a domino effect. And that domino effect activates the next protein that activates the next protein that activates the next protein. And in this cascade of events, we have a C3 molecule that binds to the surface of an invader that activates it and it cleaves, activating in turn to C5, which cleaves and in turn activates C5B until you get this polymerized, glued together um, protein that is a combination of C5B, C6, C7, C8, but especially a whole lot of C9s. The C9s, along with this polymerized molecule, actually form something called a membrane attack complex. And if you look here, it looks like a pipe, which is exactly what it is. It creates holes in the membrane of the invader. And as these holes are created, just like if I were to punch holes in you, you wouldn't like it, the cells don't like it either. And remember that the cells that are floating around in your body are in fluid, so the holes will allow fluid from outside to just flood in, which can cause them to overinflate and explode, or it can basically cause their guts to come out. Either way, you have a non-functional bacteria or invader that is in the body. The reason that they call it the complement is because it actually complements the function of your immune system. It helps it out. It works together with it. There are two paths that this activation can take. One of them is called the classical pathway. The other one is called the alternative pathway. But in reality, the only reason that they're called different names is because of when they discovered them. So the classical was basically found first. And because it was found first, they consider it the first way that it does it. And the alternative is something that they found later. In reality, both things were happening. It was just, we were unaware of them. We didn't know. The classical pathway, in order for the complement cascade to start, in order for the ball to get rolling, you have to have an antibody bound to the invader that activates C3. This was the first way that they saw it and they thought that it had to be that way. Well, later research found out that in reality, the complement doesn't necessarily need an antibody to be there to start the chain reaction. It can start it by itself, and that's called the alternative pathway. So if you look here, this is an electron micrograph. It's a scanning electron micrograph. This is the surface of my bacteria. See all of these rings? These are actually my membrane attack complexes. And if you look, there's one inserted here. You can kind of see there's stuff floating out. It's actually made a hole, and our guts are coming out of our cell. And you can see that there's kind of deformation here where it's losing its insides. This is really kind of cool. Now let's talk about iron binding proteins. Just to, to say it again, given the fact that human pathogens, almost all of them, have to have iron in order for them to actually be pathogens. It's required for them to function. It's really important that we have these systems or these proteins that keep it out of the pathogen's hands. Now, I'm gonna mention something. The things that I'm going to show you are not really necessarily specific, just like it's non-specific immunity, to playing keep away with the pathogen. Honestly, it's more about us, 
So the top two here, transferrin and hemoglobin. These are naturally occurring. Hemoglobin is what we have in red blood cells that binds to iron and then oxygen binds to the iron inside of the hemoglobin. This is normal, but because hemoglobin binds to that iron, it keeps it out of just general fluids in the body. When we do break down old red blood cells so that we can recycle, the thing that actually carries that iron to the place where we make the red blood cells is called transferrin. To transfer, that's what this does. Again, it isn't specifically designed to do anything with this, but it helps us out. We also have hepatoglobin and hemopexin. These two proteins are in our bloodstream. And if for some reason we have a red blood cell that ruptures, when a red blood cell ruptures and all of its insides go out, hemoglobin can't keep its shape. And when it starts to unravel, it releases the iron. So iron starts floating around in the blood. These two molecules are in the bloodstream literally to go, oh, I got you. And they don't let it just float around. Instead, they kind of keep it and transfer it to a better destination. Remember, this is nonspecific, so it's not specifically attacking anything, but it is keeping that iron out of the hands of the pathogen, so it is helping us. Finally, we have the antimicrobial proteins. These are normally relatively short proteins between 12 and 50 amino acids. They're not really big three-dimensional complex proteins. They are able to insert themselves into the plasma membrane of a bacteria. As an individual piece, it's probably not that effective, but when you start adding them up, you get something like this, where I've made a hole here, I've made a hole here and now it's a complete path from one side, the inside of my cell, to the other, the outside of my cell. If enough of them get together and form enough holes or pores inside of a plasma membrane of a foreign invader, it will actually cause it to rupture. Just like me punching holes in you, I don't necessarily have to make a hole this big in you with my um, complement membrane attack complex. If I make enough holes this big in you, it's actually gonna damage you enough that it's gonna cause you to probably expire, right? And again, it's just about size, something this big versus something this big. Now, while I understand this is a lot smaller, if I poke you enough with it, it's gonna cause damage, right? With these little proteins, it's the same thing. They're small, but when you add them up, eventually it makes the cell membrane very unstable. And as a cell membrane becomes unstable, it's going to eventually rupture and kill that invader or microbe. One of the other interesting facts about this um, set of antimicrobial proteins, scientists are actually trying to do research to develop these into a functional treatment for infections, which is really neat.